Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to another edition of old school, new school hand analysis. We are going to look at a hand today that was on the heels of really a moment at the Poker Masters here in 2017 where I really started to go, oh my God, these German kids, Stefan Sondheimer and uh, of course Corey Aldemir and all these other guys, they talk about the game and they understand the game at a level that I don't in terms of, you know, just talking about combos and different things like that. So it's what was the precipitous really for me to go, you know what, time to get in the lab, hardcore, and learn a little bit more about how to sort of like analyze hands in the way, in the way that we do now, which is, you know, the new school version. But as always, we're going to start this out by going a old school. Let's do the doodle 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 do. All right. We are going to break this hand down first and foremost, like we would old school. And it actually works for this hand because my thought process was mostly old school, you know, in this, in this hand. And I'll give you the, oh, so here's what happened. All right. Start the hand. I've got 634,000. Nice, healthy stack. Corey Aldemir has 415,000, okay? And the blinds are just 1,500, 3,000. So you're talking about, you know, well over 100 big blind poker, right? Corey Aldemir raises from the cutoff to 7,000 with the jacks. And I'm in the small blind, and I got the old queen 10 offsuit, which is not a very good hand, right? You know, like, I'm not going to just call this guy because it's junk. I mean, I guess I could call to try to take a flop with him, but, like, I don't know. I feel like, you know, I'm old man D-Negs, right? I don't three bet that much. So when I do three bet, these guys should give me some credit, I think, right? So I should be able to get away with more stuff when I do three bet. And the guy's raising in late position. He's probably stealing. These kids, you know, they play a lot of hands, right? So I go, okay, let's three bet it. I make it 27,000, which felt to me like, bro, that's hefty. Get the hell out of my pot. You know, that's a big raise. At least, you know, that's how I viewed it. So now we're talking about a pot with 61,000 in it. And here comes our flop. It's King Jack 8 with two clubs. And now with 61 in the pot, I actually make a nice little new school style bet. I give it a little little dinky um, 16K, which is uh, right around, you know, a quarter of the pot or whatever. And here I'm thinking, all right, well, I don't want him to bet bigger, right? I, I, I want to, like, just charge myself the cheapest amount I can to try to hit this draw now that I have an open and a straight draw, right? Um, so I feel like I have to bet something because if I check, maybe he's going to bet bigger. And then I'm like, I don't know, in a tougher spot. So I bet small, he calls. Now the pot's got 93,000 in it. Okay. And the turns, the deuce of hearts. So I still have the old nothing burger, right? Um, but I decide, you know, like these guys don't think I bluff much, right? They all have me pegged as like a non bluffer and I'm, they're right. Right. So I'm like, okay, I should be able to get away with murder. So, like, as long as this guy doesn't have a really, really good hand, maybe I can just plow this one through, right? Besides, I still have outs, you know? So it's like a semi-bluff. I could still, you know, catch my card. I need an ace or a nine to make the straight. But, like, what if he's just peeling the flop and then, like, I bet again. He's like, whoa, whoa, you know, old man D-Nags bet. I'm going to fold my jack or, I don't know, maybe a king. Who the hell knows, right? So I bet 45000 He calls. Now we got 183000 in the pot. River is the nine of spades. I mean... I'm, I'm trying to get value now, right? So with about 183 in the pot, I'm thinking, all right, well, how much will this guy call? Like with a king or whatever. I'm thinking, I want to I want to make it big. I don't want to do like a small little dinky bet. So I go ahead and I bet 125,000 into 183. And he goes all in. I have the nuts. I snap call. Yay, I'm the hero. What a great play. How good did I play? We're going to find out in the new school review that... Uh, didn't play so well. All right, let's move forward. Okay, redo the hand now. New school analysis, okay? As I said, sitting on a big stack, as is Corey Aldemir. He raises in the cutoff to 7,000. Pretty standard open um, sizing at this stage. Maybe on the smaller side considering our depth, but there's other stacks at the table that are shorter. We're both doing quite well in the tournament. Um, and now I'm in the small blind, and I have queen 10 off. And this is just a fold, really. I mean, the problem with having, if you're, if you're like three betting with queen 10 offsuit as a combo, like you're just three betting way too much, right? And if you're not factoring in like, well, what combos of queen 10 are you doing that with? And if you're doing it with all queen 10s, that's 16 combos of queen 10. And that's just going to be like, you're going to end up three betting way too much. So, you know, theoretically what you should probably be doing here is maybe folding your queen 10 offs and three betting your queen 10 suited, which is counterintuitive to what I used to do right? I used to be like, whoa, I'm suited. I have a hand that plays really well post-flop. 
I don't want to get re-raised off my hand, right? That was an old school uh, irrational type fear where you're worried about if you three bet and they four bet, you have to fold a hand that plays well post-flop. But the truth is people don't four bet that much, right? And even if they do, the sizing is going to be pretty small where a lot of the time you'll still be able to get to a flop, you know, with a hand that again, plays well post. So queen 10 offsuit is not supposed to be in my three betting range. But we did it. And what did we do with it? We made it 27,000, which is exactly nine big blinds. And I hope you guys that have been watching this for a while have learned that out of position, that's too small. Okay. If I was in position and the cutoff raises to, you know, just a little over 2x, I can make it 27, 25 even, 24 um, in that spot in position. But when you're out of position, especially this deep, it's very important that if you are going to be raising that you need to increase your size significantly. Like like 13, like what would it be? It would be, it would be like instead of making 27, we're talking like 39, okay? Like real big, really, you know, you know, force the action because what happens is when you raise too small and again i thought in the old days i thought it was big enough when you raise too small when you're playing deep you're just giving your opponent like a really good price to take a flop in position when you've got all this you know stack to pot ratio situation going on where like you know you're at a disadvantage position wise so you don't want to be in a lot of these spots but if people are going to be calling you in position when you three bet you want to charge them the maximum right you don't want to make it easy you want to sort of uh narrow down the range of hands that can profitably call uh, against your three bet when you're out of position. So looking back, I think the sizing is a mistake. I think uh, probably, you know, 37, 30, 37 in that neighborhood is probably closer to ideal um, against his, you know, basically like a min raise, right? So, you know, now he calls. Flop is king, jack, eight. Uh, that's a good flop for, you know, that's going to be a good flop for our range. We, you know, we have all of our strong hands and some of our you know, semi-bluffs have, are going to hit this flop. Um, but it's also a flop that should hit a decent amount of his range, although, you know, he's going to have a lot of hands too that that whiff, like, you know, pocket fives, pocket sixes, maybe some suited aces and things like that, that would open and call the three bet and then maybe fold on this flop. So standard sizing here for the most part is going to be small. And I actually got this right, even though I didn't know it was pretty much right. It's what a solver would suggest is likely correct is right around quarter pot. And I actually bet um, right around quarter pot. So that's actually fine with my hand. Uh, You want to mix in some checks with queen 10 there. But I think overall, um, considering you're going to be at the bottom of your range here and you do have equity because you've got an open and straight draw, it makes a lot more sense to go ahead and bet. And then if he makes a small raise, we're obviously going to continue uh, with the call. Now there's 93,000 in the pot. Turn is a deuce. And I go ahead and bet about half pot. And I actually think this is fine. This is, this is actually okay. Um, again, you need to have bluffs on the turn, right? You can't just be like, all right, I three bet, I bet the flop, and I bet the turn, so I have it. What are your bluffs, though, right? Well, this is a really good candidate because generally, you know, often you want to use a couple factors. You want to use the bottom of your range for the most part. You want to use hands that have some equity. This one does. You also want to have a hand that has blocker effects. Voila, the queen 10 has all the above. With queen 10, I block king queen. I block king 10. I block jack 10, jack queen. I block a lot of hands uh, here that, uh, you know, he might want to continue with. So in terms of sizing, this is a spot where generally on the turn, the way I play now, I would usually go with like either 30% pot or two thirds pot rather than half pot here, but it's not bad. It's fine. It's like a merge of the two, right? Um, but either size, I think, in this specific spot would have been good. Like, I mean, I guess he can he can have sets of, well, he does have a set of jacks, so he can certainly have a set of jacks or a set of kings even. So in terms of, like, high-end range, I think when he just, when he, I, I think he can have aces and everything in his range here. So I think it's pretty even, but because I've taken initiative preflop and c-bet, and again, I have the factor of, you know, bottom of my range, blocker effects, and equity— it makes this is a this is a hand that makes a lot of sense for me to bluff this turn with. Okay, I do, and he just flat. So a lot of people might be going, "Whoa, why didn't he raise the turn?" Right? Oh, well, he's not supposed to raise the turn. Okay, that might sound crazy to you, but his play is just fine with three jacks. Right? What he's doing here is he's somewhat protecting his calling range. Right? If you always raise with the top with the top part of your range on the turn after a bet, 
then when you just call, you allow your opponent to really abuse you on the river by firing a big bullet uh, on the river. So you need to have some slow playing spots. And this is a spot where he shouldn't really be worried too much at all about giving up any equity because I'm really not going to have many combos, or at least in theory, I shouldn't have many combos that have equity here against three jacks. If I have ace-king, I have no outs. If I have aces, I have two. Big deal. If I have king-queen suited or something like that, I'm drawing dead. So most of the range, most of my value range here is drawing dead, except for one, which is aces. Literally all my value range, except for aces, is drawing completely dead. The rest are bluffs. Well, guess what? Corey doesn't think that I'm balanced with my bluffs here. So he thinks my turn bet is value heavy. So there's no real reason in him worrying about raising this turn. He can flat, and then I'm probably going to bet the river with my value, or uh, and then he can go ahead and put the raise in, which is what he does. Unfortunately for him, the river was the nine. And I like my sizing here. Bravo. I think my sizing is good here. Although, again, that card's supposed to be better for him than me. Can you guess why? Why is the nine better for him than me? Well, in theory, he's supposed to have more queen 10 than I do, slightly, I think, as played. Because of what he thinks about how I construct, uh, I don't think he thinks I'm going to be three betting with queen, you know, with queen 10 offsuit. Maybe I've just got the queen 10 suited. He may still, because the raise was small, call with queen 10 offsuit, preflop. It's marginal, but it's, you know, it's possible. Uh, but overall, I think, you know, as played, the nine is probably better for his range than mine. Uh, as in this case, it was better for me. So I go ahead and bet two thirds pot, roughly. He goes all in to three jacks, I call. And I remember the discussion that him and Stefan were having after, and I was like, holy shit, you guys are smart. And one of the th- things they, they, they touched on, and I didn't really understand the way in which they were discussing this hand, was just how, you know, I'm not supposed to, like, because why does he raise the river, right? Well, when you, when you, when you have the three jacks there, you're thinking about, okay, what's, my, my value range is pocket aces, uh, ace king, uh, pocket kings, right? So of those, only kings beat you, right? So there's, you know, three combos of that, big deal. And then the only other hand that could beat you is queen 10, which there are 16 combos of queen 10, but I'm not supposed to have that many. I'm supposed to have about four. So when you factor in like all the ace kings, which there's 12 combos of, and maybe some king queens, or even, you know, a combo of king jack is possible there, or even king nine, I don't know, a whole bunch of different ones. Um, I think overall he made the calculation that, my reign, that, that his hand is still above the, like, you know, it's, his, his hand is still a value bet. He's not going to, not going to, it's called value cutting. Like when you value bet a worse hand than your opponent has, like you actually want the guy to call and he does and you still lose. And this is a case where he did that. But I think when he, when he factors in the entirety of my value range that he beats versus what, what he doesn't, I think he beats, or at least I think his assertion was that he beats more of it than he doesn't. Um, I don't know if that's true back then. Because I really just wasn't bluffing very much overall, I don't think. So if I'm not, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Tough one. Anyway, you can't fault the guy. You know, the real question is when you're that deep in a tournament, should you raise? Um, and he elected to go for it because he thought it was close enough. But I remember the, just the conversation and the way they were thinking about the hand where I was like, okay, I'm a good poker player, you know, and I have been for many, many years. But why not look to see and understand more of sort of the theory that's developed over the game. If you're a chess player and you were a chess player in 1920, you know, you learned the best way you could. And if you said, okay, I'm done learning, and you missed out on Snowy and all this software and stuff like that, you're not going to be as good as all these other people that are using this advanced software. So I really took it very seriously and I started to work really, really hard with my guys on, um, you know, understanding this nonsense of new school poker theory. So I hope you guys sort of can see the difference, understand the growth from in my mindset in this hand from looking at it previously and, and being able to ba- you know go back and go, okay, those are mistakes, but not just saying they're mistakes and because of blah, 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 but because you actually have some, you know, theory to back it up. So, so yeah, I won that pot, but I definitely lost the battle on that Poker Masters uh, overall. I did not win it. I think Stefan Sondheimer crushed me. And, uh, you know, here, you, you have two choices in life, right? Like, you get beaten in a spot, you can be like, I know everything, I'm perfect, blah, blah, blah. Or you can say, all right, you know what? Hats off to you. I'm going to learn, I'm going to improve, I'm going to get better, and I'm going to do whatever it takes. And that's always been my approach, and I hope that it's yours too. Peace, y'all. 